What's up, fight fans? Welcome to Mr. Mustache MMA News. Today, I want to discuss and break down yesterday's UFC 299 prelims. But before we get into it, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button to continue getting more MMA content by yours truly. Help the channel grow. All right, guys, getting right into it. I'm going to be discussing, breaking down what happened yesterday at the prelims for UFC 299, UFC Miami. Now that it's all wrapped, great event. Starting from Curtis Blades all the way down to the Joanne Wood fight in order. So if there's anything that you want to, to like skip and go ahead to, I'm going to be going in order from the top of the prelims all the way to the beginning of the event. All right, guys, getting right into it. Curtis Blades defeated Jalton Almeida. Second round, 36 seconds into the second round, knocked him out. In a fight, man, that was... I, I, I love the matchup from the beginning, right? Because Almeida was the new dog in the division. Has showed great wrestling, great top pressure, ground and pound submission skills. Didn't look all that good against the Derek Lewis fight. He was that able to dominate his way to victory, but it just looked sloppy in doing so, right? Like, just did not look good in victory. And you have Curtis Blades, who has been your dark horse heavyweight for quite some time now. The heavyweight takedown king, top control time king, all time. So it was, it was cool to see the wily veteran against the up and coming prospect. And I, I, I did not want to see the Colby Covington, Kamara Usman kickboxing match between the two of them. You know, usually when the wrestlers fight, they kind of cancel each other out. Ends up being a kickboxing match. That's not what we got. We got exactly what, I, at least what I hope for. And Almeida dominated the whole first round in the wrestling exchanges. Throwing Curtis Blades around, ragdolling him about, completely frustrating Blades. Blades looked bewildered. He was like, oh shit. Like, he looked like he was just not ready for that. And then going into the second round, Almeida started throwing some crazy punches. Like, hey, all right, now I'm going to strike with you a little bit. And then right back into the wrestling, overcommitted on the takedown, and Blades just throwing the hammer fist down. Completely capitalizing, showing the sense of urgency. Exactly what he needed to do at that moment after getting just completely dominated in that first round. And Blades was able to find the finish 36 seconds into the second round. And a phenomenal victory, phenomenal performance. Almeida showed again that he he's just... He fights very one-dimensional. Which just, just leaves him open. He overcommits to the wrestling a bit. So he's going to have to go back to the drawing board and have to round out his game a little bit better. Or at least disguise a lot of that. At least disguise his game plan a little better. And for Almeida, I think moving forward, I think a Sergei Spivak I think would be a good fight for him moving forward. I think it would be a good test for Spivak. And I think it would be a good fight for him after getting a loss. Kind of climbing the ranks a bit for a while. And I think Spivak's a really good test. A really good like gatekeeper position, if you will, in the heavyweight division. For Blades, he called out Tom Aspinall. I love that fight. Great call out. If you guys know, they fought before Aspinall got the belt. And it ended like a minute into the fight. And I don't even think that when Aspinall threw a leg kick. Blew his knee out when it, just, it was just a freak accident. You know, since then, Blades has had his own inconsistencies. Aspinall is now the champion. But now Blades has found himself in this really good position. Where Aspinall doesn't really have himself a dance partner. He's had the whole love triangle issue with John Jones and Steve Bay Miocic. But Curtis Blades can now just kind of slide right back in there. Because especially if Tom Aspinall wants to write that wrong. <coughs> I think he even said on Twitter himself that he was interested in that fight. So I think it's a great fight. I don't know if the UFC books that. But I think Blades and Aspinall would be a great heavyweight title match. Uh, next up, Macy Barber defeated... Caitlin Sermonara, formerly Chukagian, by decision in a fight where she just dominated Caitlin, right? I mean, Macy just went out there and just bullied her. Phenomenal pressure, landing good strikes. Macy looked good, man. I mean, she's really grown up into a really good opponent. I've, I've, I'm not a big fan of her attitude. You know, I don't know. I just look at her face sometimes. I'm just like, oh, I just don't like this woman. But nonetheless, man, she went out there, looked good. She's put on good performances now. She's really bounced back. She's matured really well as a fighter. Especially beating Caitlin Chukagian, man, who is just the ultra veteran of the women's flyweight division. And with Macy now, I she's not a 
at title shot yet, but I think that <coughs> excuse me, guys. She should fight the loser of the Man and Faro and Aaron Blanchfield fight that's coming up, I think, March 20th. So that's coming up in about 10, 11 days here. I think that fight, I think Barber versus Blanchfield would be a good fight. I think that their grappling would match up really well. And I think the striking of Faro, I think as well, would match up really well with the striking of Macy Barber. So I think the loser of that fight would probably fight my... Macy Barber and the winner of Blanchfield and Furo will probably fight the winner of Grasso versus Shevchenko 3. There's a lot going on in the women's flyweight division, man. I love how that, that whole division has grown over the years since they started that way back when with the Nico Montagna days, right? But with Macy Barber, man, it was a great win. Seeing her mature like this over the years, it's been nice to see. I haven't always been the biggest fan of her, but, but damn, she's a good fighter and you can't deny it. And when Caitlin Serbinara, you see that she's kind of just lacking that prime. Just that physicality that she used to have in the division. She looked good at moments, but she was just getting bullied out there. She was just getting big sistered out there. That, that That's just pretty much what happened. But I think with her resume, I think that she's still a top five, top six contender in the division sorry brain fart but i think next up i think of natalia silva <coughs> i think silva's earned her right to have a really good opponent and i think caitlin Sermonara is right there in that bracket in that position for an undefeated prospect like natalia silva coming up i think natalia's undefeated at least but i know that she's on a pretty good run herself um after that Mateusz Gamrot defeated RDA, Rafael Dos Anjos, and just a back-and-forth grappling match. RDA caught him super early. I think it was like a like a knee or like a head kick, and then caught him. I think it was a punch. Dropped him, and then Gamrot went immediately to the wrestling for the remainder of the fight. It was just able to just do what he does best. Be strong, long, good grappling, make good decisions, keep himself safe, use his good leverage. And uh, got a good victory over a former champion, you know. And I thought RDA, I thought he was going to have enough up his sleeve. I thought his grappling would have matched Gamrot, but I think that just, just goes to show how good Gamrot's wrestling and his grappling just really is. I just, I guess I just didn't respect it as much as I should have. But uh, Gamrot went out there and just did what he needed to do. I thought he lost the first round just because he got hurt so bad. I thought the damage outweighed the control, but rounds two and three, he really implemented domination and control to secure the victory. Moving forward, Gamrot's in this weird spot where now with Dustin Poirier, which I'll talk about later tonight, he's been outshined by Justin Gaethje, the Max Holloway thing at BMF. We don't know what's going to happen there. You got Hol uh, you have Oliveira and Sarukian. So you have Gamrot, who is like, De facto number five guy. Unfortunately. Like, cause he's he's good, but with everything that's going on at lightweight, you're either gonna have Poye, Gechi, Sarukian, or Oliveira fighting Islam. And then Cameron's behind all those guys. So something would have to happen in some weird way for him to get that shot. So I think maybe a rematch with Fazayev, I think that's unfinished business. I really personally do. I think it's unfinished business. Maybe if Fizayev, Fizayev comes back sooner rather than later. I know that happened last September and we're in February. Not February. We're in March now. That would be good. Maybe Jalen Turner rematch. You know, Jalen Turner got that nice victory over Bobby Green. I know he wants to write that wrong over Gamrot. But Gamrot's really in a weird position here at Lightweight where he's a contender. He could fight for the title. He could be world champion, but... <clears throat> it's so deep right now at 55 he's kind of fucked and rda i think a grant dawson i know grant came out and said that he has some news coming out so he's probably not going to be grant dawson but I'd, I'd like a grant dawson and an rda fight i think that would be really good maybe even drew dober i think drew dober would be a good matchup for rda i think rda's grappling would match up really well against the lack of grappling of drew dober but nonetheless good fight good grappling match you know um, Kyler Phillips defeated Pedro Munoz 
by unanimous decision in a fight, man, where he just fought the perfect fight. Stayed on his lateral movement. Peppered Pedro with shots throughout the fight, man. Through, you know, he literally fights like he's in the fucking Matrix, dude. Like, that kid is good, man. And he deserves a really good test next. Somebody like a Jonathan Martinez, who's on a good streak himself. Maybe even a Rob Font, who's on a losing streak, but is a really, really, really good opponent. But Kyler Phillips, man, went out there and was just, like, just on water. He was just walking on water out there. He was looking good, doing whatever he wanted, flying, flowing, on his lateral, moving on his bicycle, moving around that octagon. Pedro's chasing him down, trying to go the whole time, just going forward the whole time, just <coughs> landed a couple shots here and there, but just could not catch. The bull could not catch the matador in this in this circumstance. Um, for Pedro, I'd like a Ricky Simone. You know, I, I was thinking Mario Bautista, but I think Bautista's probably put himself in a, a, a higher spot than where Pedro was at now because of this loss. But maybe a Ricky Simone. I think that would be a good fight. I think I think those two would I think really go out there and stand and trade. I think that'd be a good fight. Um, after that, man, Felipe Linz, dude, defeated Ion Kutalaba by decision. In a fight where he utilized those leg kicks so early. Dude, you saw the welts on Kutalaba's left calf, dude. Woo! It was looking bad for him early. He just was not able. Because, I mean, once you took away that lead leg, he had no power in his shots. He wasn't able to really follow through in any combinations. And as he was trying, he was throwing a kill for sure. He just wasn't landing, you know. And as effective as he could have been. And Felipe was able to just have a better game plan. And just land the better shots. He was more mobile. And just those leg kicks, man. I mean, just that was the story of it. It was beautiful. You know, Felipe's now found himself in like a four or five fight win streak. So I think somebody like a Dustin Jacoby. So I think Dustin Jacoby, even though he's had some losses, he's good. He's really good. I think that he's a top 15 guy any given time. I think, I think Dustin's a great kickboxer. So I think him and Felipe, I think, would make a really good fight. And for Kutalaba, man, he's so fun to watch, but it just doesn't go his way sometimes, man. Like, I mean, more often than not lately, too, but the Hulk, he is just Hulk smash, you know, but it's like, he's like a Spartan. Like, he, he literally, like, kill or be killed every single time that guy fights almost, so... Maybe a Nikolai Negaromanu. I think that's how you say his name. I think that would be a good fight. I know Nikolai hasn't fought since his fight with, I think it was Carlos Olberg. But if he comes back, I think maybe a fight with an Ion Kutalaba, I think would be a, a fireworks of a matchup. But nonetheless, Felipe, he's looked really good. And Ion, man, he's just... Can he make 85? Is, like, is he really that thick at 205? Like, I don't know. That's why I feel like the UFC does need more weight classes. I think every 10 pounds, it's not like boxing. Boxing, they have a weight class like every three and a half fucking pounds or something, like five and a half pounds. If you have one in the UFC, 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, maybe you keep 70, you have 85, 95, 205, 225, like a cruiser weight. Because there's a lot of tweeners, man. I think like a guy like a Chase Sherman, I think would still be in the UFC if there was a 225 division, right? I don't know. I don't know. Same and same one with like a Felipe Lins too. Like I think at like 225, I think that guy would like be a fucking problem. Maybe even Kutalaba or like a Khalil. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm rambling now at this point. Nonetheless, great fight. Ian Kutalaba. I think a Nikolai Negaromanu would be a great fight. Felipe Lins, I think Dustin Jacoby would be a phenomenal matchup. Um, all right, um, Michelle Pereira, man, <sighs> finishes Michelle Oluksasek in like a minute. Went out there and just put him out with a body shot, dropped him, and then was just able to choke him out. And it, the the choke didn't even look like that cinched in. Michelle already looked done, and Pereira, man, what I mean, just going up in weight and still looking as dangerous. And fast and is explosive at 185 than he did at 170. It's pretty cool to see. And now I really want, like, at, and 
Let, like, let's not get it twisted. Oleg Sashik was a good opponent and is a good fighter at 185. And for him to just run through Oleg Sashik like that, I think he deserves a much, much bigger test going forward at middleweight. Like an Andre Muniz, a Chris Curtis, maybe even a Jack Hermanson if you want to get like real saucy with it, right? Because Jack, he's kind of put himself back into like that winning way into like the contendership top 12 conversation. But I think Michel Pereira, man, besides his few, his few weird blemishes, weight cutting issues, Tristan Connolly fight. There's one other fight. But anyways, I think he's dangerous, man. And I think I think he deserves a really good test. I think an Andre Muniz, a Chris Curtis, maybe even a Jack Hermanson moving forward would be a really good opponent. As for Michel Oksashik, can you say, man, he 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 went out there with a, against a guy who was just on, who was absolutely on, super dangerous, super explosive. Back to the drawing board. Maybe a Joe Pfeiffer. I know Joe Pfeiffer kind of had that weird fight. I think it was, it was it was Jack Hermanson, right? Where he just he just didn't look good. Just had a bad game plan, bad fight IQ. Just looked sloppy. So maybe a Joe Pfeiffer fight, because I know Pfeiffer probably back to the drawing board for him as well. Maybe a Hadolfo Vieira, because we got Vieira now who's kind of starting to climb those ranks up a little bit. Kind of get himself back into that picture. Maybe if they want to build up Adolfo Vieira, give him a, a Misha Oleksasik. That would be a really good fight. I don't know. It's my opinion. Uh, damn. The debut of Robelis Despagne. I think Despagne is how you say it. Holy shit. 15 seconds, 18 seconds. Took out Josh Parisian. Moving backwards too. He just pop, 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 pop. Put Josh out. Moving backwards. Phenomenal debut. He's earned a good test moving forward. So I think either of the Taffa brothers, I think either of those guys, with his reach too, he's going to give everybody problems. I think I think that would be another good fight to kind of build up his name as well. He's 35, so you got to move kind of weird with him. Like you, you don't want to baby him because he's 35, but with where he's at in his career, 5-0, and oh, you kind of do as well. But you got to look at Alex Pereira too. So maybe one or two more fights and he, it's really off to the races with him. <clears throat> but nonetheless, man, fuck. He put Josh Parisian out. And for Josh, no disrespect, but I kind of see him being cut. You know, gone out there. He's had his fights in the UFC. He's put on some good fights. He's had some wins, had some losses. But uh, that's probably it for him. Maybe earn himself another win because maybe he took that fight against a, such an up-and-coming killer like Rebellus. But nonetheless... Might be it for Josh Parisian. Um, Asu Almabayev defeated CJ Vergara by decision in a fight where he just used good pressure, fight IQ, was throwing a lot at CJ. CJ made it dirty, had his moments, made it a tough fight, made it a fight, was definitely still in it throughout, had his moments, had some shots, but just wasn't enough. And just that pressure, well roundedness, that the wrestling, the grappling by Alma Alma Almabayev. Was just good, man. And I think, again, himself, he's earned himself a good opponent. Maybe Cody Durden. I think Cody Durden's a good fight. Cody, who is just a dog, he's coming off the loss himself. I think he can go out there and give Alma, Alma Baev really good problems, be a really good true test in a flyweight. So I think maybe somebody like a Cody Durden. And for CJ Vergara, man, he, you know, even though he lost, he looked good in defeat, right? And that's not something you say for everybody, but he looked good in defeat. So maybe somebody like a David Dvorak who's lost, I think, three in a row now. So a CJ Vergara and I think a David Dvorak, loser probably gets cut. Winner keeps moving on. Both fan favorites, both entertaining fighters. But nonetheless, man, CJ went out there and gave it his best. Put on a dog fight, but it just wasn't enough, you know. And it kind of sucks, but put on a good fight, man. It was fun to watch. All right, guys, last but not least, Joe Ann. Wood, I was going to say Calderwood, formerly Calderwood, but Joanne Wood defeated Marina Moros to retire with a win. Lost the first round, got dominated in the grappling positions in the first. 
And then in the second match, you saw, like, okay, she had to make it dirty. She had to make it a dog fight, and she did, man. And then almost finished it, too, at the end of the third round with that spinning back fist against the fence. Almost put Moreau's out. But Wood, man, she went out there and just bullied her and just implemented her will, put on a pressure that Mar Marina just could not compete with, that she just could not keep up with. She was getting damaged. She was getting punished. She just couldn't handle it. I mean, not that she couldn't handle it. She just couldn't adjust to it. And for Joanne, man, for her to go out like that, to retire in front of her kids like that, <coughs> that's cool to see because you just don't see it that often. You don't see fighters going out with a win that often. So I hope that she stays that way. But with her getting a win like that against Marina Moroz too, because Marina's a good fighter. But, you know, you, you might be tempted to come back after a win like that. So cool to see her retire with a win like that. So congratulations to Joanne Wood from Marina Moroz. She puts on good fights. She definitely is like a do-or-die fighter. She goes for the finish, even to her detriment. Has not won since her fight against Maria Agapova a few years back. I think at least two years now. Three-fight losing streak. I think she's been finished in all those fights. Maybe an Andrea Lee. I think Andrea Lee's lost three or four in a row herself. Always an entertaining fighter. Always a game opponent. So maybe an Andrea Lee and a Marina Morose fight next. I think that would be a good matchup. All right, guys, that's going to do it for my breakdown, my recap of UFC 299 prelims. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think, what you guys think of my analysis, what you guys think is next for some of these fighters. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button to continue getting more MMA content by yours truly. Don't forget to hit the share button as well. Show the channel to your friends, the hidden channel that they never knew that they needed in the MMA world. Guys, that's going to do it for today. Mr. Mustache, MMA News out. Let's fucking go, fight fans.